Right, good afternoon. Yeah. Welcome to CCS 325, which is a class on automobile and society, on the representation early on of the automobile as the kind of technology of modernity that we are used to in our day and, and, and era and, and society. That is to say, a technology that goes beyond its primary function and means much more to the user than the execution of that function. When I first started working on this project, I was struck, struck by uh, the idea that instead of emphasizing the automobile as a more efficient way to move from point A to point B, people at the end of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, were raving about the experience of the automobile as something that goes beyond comprehension, that involves your entire body, that goes beyond your conscious mind to get deep into your psyche. And then this, the next step after that was the idea that your identity was going to be shaped by the ownership and the use of this new product. And again, this is nothing new for us, although we apply that kind of thinking to other products at this point. Because, and I'll ask you later on in this class, if you think about the magic of the automobile or how much the automobile is shaping your life or your own identity, probably the reactions I'll get will not carry much excitement. But we think in similar terms about other devices, both in terms of hardware and software, right? And how our smartphone defines, shapes the routines in our lives, who we are, the way we interact with other, with other people at this point, well, the automobile as a technology has reached its plateau and it's probably going into a declining phase. Whether or not we think of the consequences of the Green Deal and similar policies, which we'll discuss as well in this class. So the plan for today is simple. I'll introduce myself. I will go through a series of images to think about the changes that took place in the area of transportation and mobility before and with the automobile as a general introduction to introduce some core ideas for this class. At some point, I'll show you the website of this class if you were registered already in this class by early yesterday morning, you should have received a message from me. I also posted an announcement inside Brightspace with links that take you to this wiki, which is done with Notion. And I used to teach a class on digital technologies, knowledge management systems, and Notion was about a third, represented about a third of that class. So. That's something, uh, it, it's an app that I love and I find Brightspace a bit dull, right? Not so exciting. Um, after the nitty gritty of the website, the syllabus, etc., if there is time, again, we, we can have a little bit of a conversation about the significance of the automobile, the value of the automobile in your life, your memories, your family, your circle of friends. Otherwise, we uh, will have that conversation on Thursday. On Thursday, as we will do throughout the semester, we'll also have scenes from a film. The first is a Disney film from the 1960s, where the protagonist is a very famous Volkswagen Beetle by the name of Herbie. Okay? And the title of the film is The Love Bug. 
So my name is Andrea Fedi. I'm Italian. I got my bachelor at the University of Florence. Then I moved to Canada, Toronto for a PhD. And I've been at Stony Brook since 94. This is the beginning of my 31st year. Anyone completely new here, transfer or new student? Some, okay. Welcome to Stony Brook. And if you have any questions about the campus, ask me outside of the classroom time. You know, if, if I can be of help, help you navigate the culture of the campus, I'll be happy to do so. Um, the lecture is being recorded with my tablet, usually the same week of our classes, I post videos on YouTube so that if you miss a class or if you want to review a specific passage, a specific topic, you can do so, okay? Feel free to interrupt me. I hope my voice is strong enough for the people in the back. If it is not loud enough, let me know. If I mispronounce a word, let me know. Uh, if, if there is a concept uh, that is not clear, again, feel free to uh, let me know and, and I'll try to explain more clearly. Okay, this is the portal of the wiki. Let me go to the page for week one and retrieve the presentation for the introduction. So as I said before, this introduction is built around a long series of images that convey some ideas about the automobile and other technologies that we find in the same historical period that affected mobility and transportation. And clearly, at the beginning of the 19th century, there was a big change, a big revolution which was the introduction of the train. The train was based on a previous invention, the steam engine, which was not entirely new because even people from antiquity, for example, the Greeks, knew about the power of steam. And people in other areas before the Europeans, even people in Asia, had tried to experiment with the use of the energy deriving from steam. However, in 1804, you have the first test of a modern train. The rail system itself had been used before trains were introduced, believe it or not. So uh, there is the confluence of various technologies in here. So this image represents one of the first trips made by a train in England in 1825. So temporally, we're about 20 years after the invention of the train, which in automotive terms would be the first trip uh, of a car happened in 1888, 20 years later would already be at the point where automobiles were about to be mass produced and production was about to go from six to seven digits worldwide. So this is the event. This is the inauguration of the British uh, railway tracks going from Darlington to Stockton-on-Tee in the north of England, right? We're north of Manchester, north of Leeds, and close to the sea. It's an area where coal was being mined, and therefore there was a need to move large supplies of coals from the mines to the factories, right? That you would have found around Leeds, around Manchester, etc. Let's analyze this image. The quality is not great. Do your best to read the elements of the image, but I'll give you some points to extract information from this image, to interpret it from the point of view of 
the representation of the experience of a new technology. So we want to look at the technology itself, the train, the people operating and using the train. So the engineers, the people working the coal engine and the engine and feeding coal to the steam engine and the passengers, right? So one element is the technology with users and operators. The other element is the spectators, the people who are witnessing the introduction of this new technology, what's going on there. And finally, we have the physical context, the landscape, okay? N nature. Hello, this is CCS 325, okay? Good, have a seat. So, what can you tell me about any of those three elements? The technology with operators and users, the spectators, the context, the landscape. What can you read? What do you see in there? Any comments? Yes? That must have been like a pretty slow trip, just considering the amount of spectators that are waiting for it to cross the bridge and also the, the horse kind of leading the train in front. So I missed, though, the first part of your comment. Just the, the speed of the train. It wasn't very fast. And I think like... Okay, it's not about speed. Great. Right? Because you have a horse in front of it, making sure that people are not obstructing the path of the train. As far as the spectators, right? The very fact that this event has spectators, what does it tell you? Why are those people there? And we have multiple representations of this event. So this is a realistic depiction of what happened that day, which was 200 years ago, almost to the day. It was September 27th, 1824. Okay. I was going to say it's like a big cultural event, and a lot of people were excited for it. Like but materially, in, in more specifically, why were people there? How do you get people there? Automobiles? No, no, no. Well, uh, they walked or used yeah. carriages and horses, right? Mm -hmm. The automobile was still 60 years in the making. But how did they know that this event was planned? Because this is an official inaugural event, right? You see that from the man with the flag on horse and if you go back on the train you see at some point that there is an official car right with some upper class members of society who in fact were managers of the railway company and a lot of people on the train itself but these were not really passengers who, who got a ticket right they were inviting themselves the event was advertised, and I included, if you scroll down, I included the link to an image reproducing the flyer that was distributed on two different dates in September of 1824 to advertise the event, to warn people that the train would be passing and they shouldn't be, again, in the way, they shouldn't be on the tracks. And the official document was also specifying what would happen. For example, the number of cars. They specifically mentioned the composition of the entire train, the steam engine, the tender, right, which is the car with the coal, and with the workers who, with shovels, will move the coal from the load on the tender into the tank of the steam engine. Then they said there would be six cars loaded with coal, but you see that there are people on top of those cars. They said that there would be miners invited to join, participate in this uh, inaugural voyage. The authorities, the, the company's authorities, and then a selection of society 
for a total of 26 or 27 cars, 27 if you count the tender as a car. Okay, so this was specified in the original flyer together with suggestions such as whether you are on the train or outside the train, especially if you're on the train, behave, behave with sobriety, don't, bo don't be overly excited, right, uh, etc. Et so people had assembled along the line, the line itself was several miles long, it was not too long, it might have been 10 miles, 15 miles, but people had assembled, especially around various villages on the line, this image could be in the vicinity of Darlington itself to see the train go by. So there was some kind of marketing, and therefore, whenever there is marketing, you have to wonder, what's the image? What's the message that they want to convey? Why did they want to be seen, right? Why not just bring the coal and be happy with it? So my next question would be, why did they want to be seen? And what was the message that they wanted to convey, which clearly was not speed, was not the train is faster than older technologies. In this case, the older technology, the basic means of transportation was horses and carriages, which are represented by this man in front, by other people on horses nearby watching. And I think there is, oh yeah, there is a carriage here, although the resolution is bit low so you don't see it clearly okay so the old, the old technology is represented but the train is not purported to be faster than the horses and it doesn't seem to be the point if for this inaugural voyage you have a horse in front of it so what's the message what is at the core of this marketing operation that launched the train as a new means of transportation what is this image about? Think about the, the representation of the technology itself and what you see about it. Yeah. I think what like the message they're trying to convey is like how much more load that the train could transport compared to a Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Because you have all these cars being represented. In fact, they seem to disappear in the distance to the point that you cannot even count all of them. And so the message is efficiency in transporting big loads, coal, passengers, and therefore that's where the potential of the train lies, right? What about the people on board the train, the people outside the train spectating the event? Any reaction, any perception of their reaction? What's the level of excitement? Is this, are there any elements of disruption, right? What's the point, the highest point? Is this something that is being received or is something that is being feared? Any indication based on whatever we can see here? Yeah. They look like they're admiring. Right, yeah. yeah. So they came there to see the train. So they were motivated by the novelty. The train is something exotic. Exotic enough to move hundreds of people out of their homes and along the line of the train. But other than that, there is no great excitement. There is some excitement on board the train, right? You can see that people are not simply sitting still but again, even that is a moderate level of excitement. And what about the landscape? What can you say about the impact of the technology on the physical context? What do you see? What is the visual evidence of that in this image? And how big or small is this impact? So you have the technology itself, right? But what is that is physica physically changing 
in this environment? Well, I mean, you can have a train, but what's the, what is the value of a train without tracks? Right? right? So you have the tracks. The biggest impact is the tracks. And at this stage, no one can foresee how big of an impact, but entire continents will be changed by the introduction of the railroad. Entire populations will be displaced. Think of the Native Americans, for example, will di be displaced by the train. Globally, within three quarters of a century, by the end of the 19th century, globally, a lot of people, not just supplies, but a lot of people will be traveling. Train will change tourism, will expand tourism, will increase globalization to the point that by the end of the century, people will be saying, don't go to visit places that are close enough to the railroad, for example, in Europe, because those places have lost their patina, they have lost their uniqueness, right? Because if a train, if you can go by train from London to Florence, then there is bound to be a level of homogenization between all places that are connected by the train. And so by the end of the century, paradoxically, the travel writers were suggesting go off the beaten path because only if you go to a place that cannot be reached by train, that place will not be poisoned by modernity, right? And otherwise, they would write things such as, what's the difference at this point between a farmer in England and a farmer in Tuscany, right? They all belong to the same industrialized, semi-educated society, they consume the same or similar cultural products, they're under the same, the influence of the same means of communication, etc. So the past is lost or is about to vanish. Go find places that have not been touched by, civil, by modern civilization. Okay? Now, in terms of speed, of course, speed will come, right? Within 20 years, trains will reach 30, 40 miles. And the experience of speed will briefly be associated with the train to the point that we have anecdotal evidence of bizarre reactions by the people of this time, such as, will I be able to breathe when the train reaches full speed? Or will air be speeding by me? And I'll not, won't be able to, to get enough of that in my mouth. However, soon enough, the open air cars that initially were typical of these trains were replaced by closed cars. And as you know, even if you go to a train now, even the fastest trains, once you are in a closed car, you don't really get to experience speed. Yes, you can see the landscape moving fast, but physically, right, your body is not really involved in this experience of, of high speed, right? You can sit on a fast train in Italy, France, Germany, as comfortably and quietly as you sit now, okay? The experience of the automobile was and still is uh, different. The next image, of course, when we're talking about transportation, the next step is put a steam engine on a boat. Even there, experiments have, have been conducted since the early 1600s. The, something that we can consider close to being the first steamboat uh, or steamship appeared in the 1780s. This image is 1840s, so 60 years after the introduction of the steamship. Again, what do you see in here? You see a big steamship that is braving the waters of the Atlantic Ocean. You can see the representation of the uh, agitation of the water, which is both intrinsic to the environment and also caused by the speed and the mass of the boat that is advancing, of course, there are two wheels 
to the side of the boat. That's why how the energy of the engine is transferred, is translated into movement and you barely see the people on board, right? So in here as well, you have some representation of the speed, oh, about the environment. We forgot to mention the smoke that was in the previous image as it is in here, but that was not different by 1825. British cities were polluted everywhere. Industries could be found, factories, then it would have found black smoke. But as I said, there is some sense of speed in here, but we don't know much about the individual experience of speed from this image. Next is an image from, from later on, 1908. Uh, this is Niagara Fall, a, a power plant, uh, and, and then, of course, electricity from here is distributed. Even though it's 1908, electricity was being used earlier in the 19th century, but I wanted to use this image to focus your attention on the fact that after water, which had been moved with aqueducts since antiquity, and water can be used as a source of energy to move windmills, to move tools in a shop. A lot of blacksmiths from the past had their shops either next to a stream of water or above a stream of water. Don't forget that, if, especially if you go to Europe, a lot of cities built on the existing streams of water, the local brooks or small rivers, but they still kept using the water. For example, you could have a belt with a mechanism going from the underground stream of water to a shop to move a hammer, right, or other tools. So I want you to focus on the idea that electricity is both an energy source and something that moves easily, not effortlessly, because both for water, the aqueducts, and electricity, you need to have a network, right? But electricity itself is not just a source of energy. It is something that moves easily, for example, across a wire, and therefore, Electricity enters our discussion about mobility and transportation because electricity, before being a widely used energy source to illuminate and for other purposes, was a vector. A vector of what? Of a signal that could carry information. And this happened with the invention of the telegraph that followed the introduction of the train, accompanied the introduction of steamships. So all, the, all of these things were happening around the same period. This is the telegraph from the 1830s. Very ingenious, right? Because you see how the letters of the alphabet are represented by coordinates of two points, right? You have five needles, and you just have to move two of them to represent any letter in here, right? Of course, in order to have the signal for five needles, you need five wires on the telegraph line, and therefore this was soon, uh, during the next decade, being was being replaced by the modern telegraph, once the Morse code was invented, where just two kinds of signals were enough to represent the entire alphabet. But what happens here is that we are still talking about transportation, transportation of news, which has economic value, military, political value, right? And this time, if you look at this invention from the point of view of mobility and transportation, this time you see incredible speeds, right? This time you see how a message 
can travel from, let's say, by the end of the century, Beijing to Paris in a few hours. A few hours, not instantly, because the signal was fading on the wires. And therefore, you need to have a relay station every 100, 150 miles, where someone, a telegraph operator, will receive the message, transcribe the message, and then uh, send the message to the next station. But again, a few hours to cover 10,000 miles is incredible speed. And that's how the idea of this new dimension of living came into societies that embrace these technologies. That is to say, before you had efficiency, ability to move large amounts of people and supplies, but now you have something that was never experienced by humanity up until this point. That is to say, a kind of speed, the possibility of connect two points in the territory that are distant tens, hundreds, or even thousands of miles so quickly that you can see how the outlook on life and social exchanges, including transaction, commercial transactions, starts to change. Okay, so you have the beginning of the idea typical of modernity that speed is what makes modern humans different from the humans from the past. Because up until this point, no one had experienced speed in excess of 20 miles or so, 30 miles with traditional means. And we'll talk about the traditional energy sources. And I'm talking about the speed of a horse, the speed of a sheep moved by sails in the past. Okay? So this is where the idea of speed enters the field of mobility and transformation. So this is a representation of the first trip by an automobile. It's August 1888. Bertha Benz, Mrs. Benz, wife of Carl Benz, the industrialist, takes the automobile that her timid husband has been testing on the grounds of the factory, but has never taken on a, on a road outside of the factory. She takes the car, she takes her two kids, and she travels a totality of 66 miles to see some relatives. Gatsy move. And she was not just a naive wife, she was uh, involved in the management of, of the Benz uh, company. Her family had provided quite a bit of money, invested money in the factory. As I said before, Carl wasn't sure that his invention was ready. Let me show you what I'm talking about because there are thousands of replicas that have been built. The original is lost, but this would be a replica of the car used by the vehicle, the tricycle used by Bertha. And Bertha not only goes out, but goes out for a great distance. Of course, it took her uh, something like nine hours, even carries her kids. And, and she has, of course, to face a lot of different issues. For example, this monument is here on this small piazza in a small German town because this is where she stopped for gas. But the question would be, how could she stop for gas? This is the first automobile. There are no gas stations, right? It's not like people were waiting for their first customers. Did I do the right career move opening this gas station, right? No, simply she went into a pharmacy or a drugstore because benzene was used as stain remover. Even when I was a kid, I, I was born in 1963, I remember my mother would go to a drugstore and buy this small jar 
of benzene because it's a powerful stain remover. Don't do it because it's also not good for your health, right? The fumes are, are uh, not good for you. She had to fix the brakes and fix other mechanical parts, which she was able to do. And more importantly, she demonstrated that the vehicle was ready for production, was ready for uh, use. And, and her husband started producing and selling the vehicles. What I like about the monument is that the car is only represented very essentially, because this is how the car was seen in the 20th century. That is to say, this is a representation of humans in motion. The automobile almost disappears because the automobile reduced to its, its essential trait is just speed and motion. Of course, the vehicle was very slow, slower than a horse, but it doesn't matter. It's the beginning of that idea that the automobile adds speed to the life of individual users, not entire communities, as in the case of the train or, or the ship, where you have a, an infrastructure, you're not operating the train, you're not operating the ship, you're being carried, you're a passenger, you're going from point A to point B. That is about transportation, mostly. In this case, the automobile is about moving, about existing in this dimension not the dimension of transferring from point A to point B, but the dimension of motion, right? And motion is added to you in a physical and psychological way at the same time, because of course, for a vehicle from this period, you feel it physically, even more than now. You feel all the vibrations, of course, you feel the road, and we're talking about dirt roads, so forget about comfort, a lot of bone shaking for this kind of experience. You smell the oil from the engine. You smell the benzene. Initially, they were actually using uh, different kinds of alcohol or benzene, not, not the kind of gasoline we have now. It was the, the essence of uh, today's uh, gas. So a lot of stimulation physically and then this idea that you are entering a kind of experience that is unique, that you can describe to others, but until you try it, is, is, there, is, there is no uh, substitute uh, really. Okay? Any questions or comments so far? Am I going to quickly, and you don't have to remember everything, just try to get some of the ideas and we'll return to those ideas during the semester with the help of films, documents, other kinds of materials. Of course, if you want to have a visual representation of the impact on the environment of the car, you can look at images of highways built especially during the 1960s and 70s in the U.S. and in a lot of other countries. And it's easy to go from here to other kinds of environmental impact, right? Although there is a misconception about the correlation between cars and pollution. Because we take the car as a whole and we see it as unique, as a product. And we tend to limit our view of pollution to just a few things because we don't distill the polluting elements from the technology. But what is the element in the car that produces pollution in a traditional internal combustion engine car? The answer is the the engine, right? The engine, burning gas, uh, etc. Once you take the engine out of the car and identify it as the source of pollution, then pollution has to be assessed in terms of engines. 
And at this point, if you think of engines, you can see a range of products, vehicles, means of transportation, producing pollution. And in fact, even some of the smaller engines that are not in cars are polluting a lot. For example, lawnmower, because lawnmowers are not regulated as much as cars. So a small engine on a lawnmower, unless you have an electric one, will pollute a lot. Planes, of course, are big polluters. The biggest of them all, though, are not cars, with a scale that surpasses cars by, by a lot. Where do you find the engines that produce the most amount of pollution? Try to guess. Think of the biggest engines. Be ships. Ships, of course. Again, they, their regulations are, are much different, different, right? We're talking about enormous engines and they pollute a lot. Then, of course, we'll talk about the future of the automobile and electric automobiles. But in terms of environmental impact, you know that on day one, when you take an internal combustion engine new from the factory, from the dealer's lot, or an electric car, where's the biggest impact on day one? When you drive up a lot? No, the biggest impact is on the side of the electric car. The, meaning the environmental impact is front-loaded on electric vehicles because production produces pollution twice, more than twice as much pollution as the production of a traditional vehicle. So day one, your environmental impact, having chosen an electric car, I drive an electric car, small one, a Fiat. People smile when I go by, it's like a clown car. But I like it, it's unique and quirky. But day one, your impact on the environment having chosen an electric car has been bigger and it takes a few years to even up things and then to save uh, the environment using an electric vehicle, especially because potentially you could be using an electric vehicle longer than a traditional vehicle, potentially because they're, they're making things too complicated and, and making this in some ways, in many ways, a failure, this, this change. Talking about environmental impact, we're on Long Island. We are in an area that you could define suburban, actually in traditional terms would be exurban at this point at Stony Brook, right? Suburban would be Brooklyn, Nassau County, etc. Because there are automobiles, right? Not so many people were living on Long Island until the 1920s, but once the automobile was available, millions of people moved out of the city and into Long Island and then commuted with cars, trains, etc. And this is the typical design, the layout, the planning of suburban areas. And how is this reminiscent of the automobile? It's like a parking lot for cars and houses, right? There is no imagination, no creativity, right? It's all about the driveway into a secondary road that will take you into a highway. It's not about the lifestyle, right? In fact, if anything, the lifestyle would be inside the house. And in the 1950s and 60s, you have to think in, I don't know if you've seen Mad Men, Right? You go back to a house like that at the end of the day, and the first thing you do, you get a cocktail or a drink. Right? Because what else is there other than crazy neighbors? There is no, this doesn't afford any other kind of meaningful life or interaction. But talking about speed, speed has been associated specifically with cars for a very long time, and to this day, there is almost an obsession, both in the industry, in the marketing, and on the side of consumers, 
the buyers, the users, an obsession with speed. Because how would you explain otherwise? And by the way, uh, this is one of many videos that you find on the page that is embedded in the page so you can play this video. If, if you press the play button, you can play this or you can press the watch on YouTube video to watch the whole video. So how would you explain a uh, street legal car, right? The, the flag is there to say, we're proud to be the fastest car in the world that is street legal and it's an American car, right? But how would you explain the idea, right, of a car that is street legal and that has a top speed of over 300 miles per hour, right? With speed limits of 55, etc. It's just an obsession. And it's just the idea that speed will sell the car, right? Which is not limited to the Hennessy venom, but extends to, for example, electric cars, right? How are they selling electric cars? Are they telling people through marketing, buy the electric car because it's green, buy the electric car to save the planet, buy the electric car because the engine has fewer parts, right? It, I've, I've owned an electric car for six years. The only thing I've had to do was change the 12 volt battery. I haven't replaced the um, brakes because of course I regenerate electricity when I brake. I, I don't go metal to metal. I didn't have to change lubricants, don't change oil or other lubricants, right? They're not selling the cars, the electric cars this way. How are they selling them? Ludicrous speed. Come experience the acceleration of a Tesla or another electric car or get this humongous car, right? Think Model Y, Model X, which is so big and yet it's also so very fast. Meanwhile, of course, it becomes also very expensive because in order to move two tons of steel and batteries at these speeds for 300 miles, you have to install a ton of batteries, which are expensive, which have an impact, right, on the, uh, on, on the environment. But as I said, we'll, we'll talk about electric cars and in, in what ways this is kind of a failing revolution for, for society because of the attitude of the industry. I don't know if you follow or have seen videos of Marcus Brownlee. Marcus, at some point, created a channel, first experimented with some videos on his own channel, then uh, uh, initiated another channel called Autofocus to talk about cars, especially electric cars. Right, so this is his presentation of the fastest car ever made, and you can see his attitude. This this is impossible. So this is the Rimac Nevera, and uh, so be careful here because they use the dots confusingly, half American, half European style. But this car has almost 2,000 HP, right, which would be probably 10 times the power of your car, your average car. Uh, 0 to 60, 1.74 seconds, 0 to 189 seconds, top speed 258 miles, and you can learn more from the video if you want. But this is not enough, right? Because you need to go faster, and therefore that was 2022, but already there are other cars that are saying, no, no, I'm, I'm the fastest car. And I've in included some links so you can uh, learn about some of the alternatives. This, um, they, they brought one of those cars last year to Connecticut. You could go and sit and, and consider buying it for, I think it was about a million or starting from a million, but that's not street legal. One seater just for track and this claims to be 
even faster, 1.4 seconds for the uh, 0 to 60 test, right? So it seems that they continue to sell cars based on the idea of speed, even when people will not be driving at those speeds, are not able to do so. Think of celebrities or regular people who've died on exotic cars because when you're driving a car this fast, you're not controlling the car with your steering. You have to be careful around the brake and the accelerator because the car, these cars will torque steer. That is to say, if you accelerate when the car is, is not balanced, the car will turn on you and, and you can smash, um, right? Uh, think of the actor uh, for the Fast and Furious series who died as the passenger on a very powerful Porsche driven by someone who was not able to control a car that powerful. But it's just the idea. It's the idea of saying how fast is your car, right? More than the experience itself. Now, talking about cars and the uniqueness of this technology, one thing that has to be mentioned is that among modern technologies, the car is second to no, no other technologies in terms of inclusion in art collections. So this is an exhibit that I visited at MoMA two years ago called Automania. Automania is a phrase coined in the early 1900s, a frenzy created by this new product, but this is a regular museum, right? The car, in fact, this car, this specific car was purchased many years ago by MoMA when this was still big news that a modern art museum would purchase a car. This is a Cisitalia from the 1940s because they said the design of this car is a form of art. And since then, MoMA has purchased other vehicles and routinely has uh, exhibits or uh, shows uh, these cars um, in their rooms, the cars in their collections. I've added, this was one of the items <coughs> on display at Automania, right? And underneath this image, you find my, my long scholarly analysis of this image. This would be, this is from the early 1900s from Northern Europe. And this is the modern reproduction, the modern version of a myth represented by many artists, such as Titian, for example, which is the abduction of Europa. Europa is a Phoenician princess living in what today would be Lebanon. Zeus, the god of the Greeks, the chief of the Greek gods, comes to her, but in order to trick her, comes in the form of a bull and takes her. She rides the bull. They go into the sea, to the island of Crete, where Zeus will reveal himself and they'll have kids, they'll be together for a while, etc. But the idea, the metaphor of the abduction is being used here to represent the rapture of technology. How this new technology overwhelms you rationally and just takes you away. And you can see that through the state of abandon of the female body, right? is just completely immersed in this experience. And by the dehumanization of the driver, right? You cannot really see the eyes of the driver because of the goggles, because of the cap and the, the scarf that, that shields his head from the dust. He has some kind of furry coat on top so it's almost like an animal. On the other hand, the car is being humanized, right? Look at the eyes. They're like kids' eyes, right? Look at this. It's like the car has teeth. 
almost a nose. And the car itself is something magical that will take you out of this world. So the idea is the, pro the promise of an out-of-world experience that takes you whether you want or not. And therefore is as powerful as drugs or as mystical as uh, experiences, uh, spiritual experiences of the past. As I said, you can find this analyzed further, so I'm not going to insist. And you find more in here just to make you reflect on the relevance of this technology in our society. A lot of modern, the biggest automotive museums of today have been introduced only in the past 20 years. This is the Mercedes-Benz Museum and I've introduced other, uh, I've linked other museums as well. Think of the vintage car market and how significant it is economically, although there are changes in here as well. What other technology from the past would fetch this kind of prices that are in fact similar to prices that are being paid for art? And I'll stop here for now and go show you, and, and you can see this by yourself, some basic information about the class and, and you can ask questions and, and perhaps you, you can tell me more if we have time. So in order to find the class website, unless you've saved the link that I sent via email, you can just go to andreafedi.com and in there, I'll click on this link. The first link here is Automobile and Society. And here you are again. Otherwise, you can simply, there is a shortcut that'll take you there. The program into the website, my domain, personal domain, andreafedi.com slash CCS325 the name of this class, if you put that in the browser, you can get to the class website. As I said before, because this wiki is housed in the server of the Notion company, their links are not so nice. They cannot be simply memorized. By the way, if you don't know about Notion, anyone with an EDU email account can have the professional plan for free. And it's great. It's great for notes, for your classes, for project management. Uh, you, you can try and experiment with it. So the structure, the main sections of the class are simple. The main section is, of course, the page for lectures and readings. And each week has a page and different presentations related to it. So, of course, you find a list of the topics, but the most important part is the page called Week 1. And inside Week 1, as you've seen multiple times, you find the presentations you find a page on the film that we'll start watching on Thursday. Actually, we'll watch some scenes this Thursday and more next Thursday. And this is also where you find the videos of the class. Right, right now, it's too early, but you can see the presentation, the general introduction from fall 2023. And as I said, in a day or two, you'll find a video for this very class. At the end of each page, you find, besides the assignments, you find navigation patterns. And let me show you the other sections of the class. Of course, you have a page for news and announcements. I try to include here bits from the news that show the relevance 
of the technology. For example, every August, not too many days ago, there were a series of auctions in California called the Pebble Beach Auctions. And every year, at least for the past three years, the amount of money exchange for cars, for vintage cars, is roughly $400 million. To give you an idea of the size of this operation, this is just one event and three auction houses. And you can have an idea here of some of the cars that were sold. Okay. Of course, you have a welcome uh, message. I included some images. This is a mural from last year's Electrify Expo. Electrify Expo is a moving car show and fair and comes to Long Island, used to come to Long Island every summer. This year they didn't do a summer event on, on Long Island, but they're going to do, do a fall event in October in New York City. And this is their idea. So this was behind the Toyota pavilion, right? So Toyota is selling cars, but behind the pavilion, uh, I don't know if it was that, them, their marketing department, or the expo itself, put this image of the future, right? You see a generic city, urban area in the back, and there are no cars. Some people have walking shoes, others have electric scooters, and no cars, fewer cars, can very well be the future uh, for, for this kind of product. In fact, so of course there is a section for the syllabus and you can find here my contact information. I don't know if this is too small. Try this way. So you can find me on Zoom three mornings a week. And you can make an appointment on Zoom through this link. The app is Calendly. <coughs> or you can visit me after the class. Right after this class, I go to my office in the library inside the Center for Italian Studies. I'm the director of the Center for Italian Studies, by the way. Soon, on September 15, we'll organize a concorso d'eleganza with Italian cars. And if any of you is available, wants to volunteer, extra credits will be profusely distributed, okay? So this is where you can find me and my email and everything else. And let me just show you briefly, you know how syllabi have become very long, but these are the components. So 25% of your final grade is attendance, class activities, and assignments, simple assignments that will be done at home. For these assignments, we use Google Docs files. I'll create those Google Docs files and share the files with you individually by the end of this week. And there you put every assignment and the final project as well. So we can both uh, easily track what we're doing for me, provide feedback, etc. Um, at the end of the semester, there is a project, and we'll talk about the project at the beginning of October. For the project, you have to give a brief presentation, either on Zoom or pre-recorded. My recommendation is to present individually on Zoom. There is the project itself, which has a page with a lot of details, but we'll go through that page. There will be a week devoted to how to do the final project. And 25% for a final exam with essay questions, okay? And you find a lot of other things. So first of all, questions about the syllabus, questions about the class, and then any kind of questions on the class in general. 